This video will cover the Geometry Common Core exam from June 2015, questions 6 through 11. Question 6 says, which figures can have the same cross-section as a sphere? And if we think about a sphere, it's like a basketball. And a cross-section means if we were to slice through it with a knife and cut out a thin piece of it, what shape would it be? And if we look at a sphere, a basketball, if I cut through a basketball or even an orange, I would get a cross-section of a circle. Or if you think about it in terms of it being sort of flat, it's like an oval. So I have to figure out if I were to slice through each of these shapes, what cross-section would be the same as that of a sphere, a circle. So if I were to cut through choice one, look, which looks like a rectangular prism, I would end up with a cross section that's also a rectangle. So that's not going to be our choice. If I cut through this pyramid that has a four-sided base, I would end up with a shape of a four-sided base as the cross section. Now if I look at this cone here, if I were to cut through the cone, because it has no defined edges or faces like this rectangular prism had, I have to cut in a circular fashion going around if I were to slice through this with a knife, I would get a circle. Even if I cut up higher on the cone, I would still end up with a circle. Now let's just make sure that that is our choice instead of choice four. If we cut through choice four with a knife, to find a cross section. Because it has particular edges and faces, I would end up with a cross section that's the shape of a rectangle, just like its base. You can pretty much find out the cross section, the shape of a cross section, by looking at the base of the figure that you're cutting. So here again, in the, the rectangular prism in choice one, the base was a rectangle, so the cross section is a rectangle. In number two, a cone, the base is a circle, so my cross section is a circle. No matter where you cut it, you end up with the shape of the base. So choice two is our answer for number six. Number seven is a pretty lengthy question, and so it's important that we underline, highlight, circle, anything that we th think might be helpful to answer this question. We should also sketch pictures because we're talking about a shipping container that's in the shape of a right rectangular prism. So when I sketch this, it's going to look kind of like a tissue box. So I'm going to start with the front face, the rectangle. Then I'm going to extend each of the corners back diagonally, and then just connect them to make another diagonal or another rectangle in the back. It says that this rectangular prism has a length of 12 feet, so 12 can be labeled here, a width of 8.5, and a height of 4. The container is completely filled with contents that weigh, on average, 0.25 pounds per cubic foot. What is the weight in pounds of the container, um, of the contents in the container? So what we first need to find is the volume because it says completely filled, meaning calculate the volume we're filling this up. So volume of a rectangular prism is length times width times height. So I'm just going to plug in because I know the length is 12. The width is 8.5 and the height is 4. So multiplying each of those when I type them into my calculator gives me 408. And I know that each of these were feet and because I multiplied feet times feet times feet, that's feet cubed. Now you can see that 408 is a choice here, but that's not our choice. We're asked about the weight in pounds. Right now I have cubic feet. So I need to change the cubic feet to pounds. And we can do this very easily by setting up a proportion. If we think about pounds over feet cubed, we'll be able to solve this easily. So now I know that I have x pounds to 408 cubic feet. Again, I'm trying to figure out how many pounds 408 cubic feet is, so I chose to call that x. Then I know that 0.25 pounds is per one cubic foot. When I have a proportion, I can cross multiply to solve. So I have x equals 408 times 0 
When I type that into the calculator, I end up with 102. So now I know that 408 cubic feet is the same as 102 pounds. And because they asked for the answer in terms of pounds, our choice is 3. So again, the answers for this page are number 6 is 2 and number 7 is 3. Question 8 says, in the diagram of circle A shown below, chords C, D, and E, F, F intersect at G, and chords C, E, and F, D are drawn. Which statement is not always true? So it looks like there's going to be three true statements and one false statement, and we want the false statement. Looking at this picture, we need to figure out what's true based on the diagram. So we're just going to jot a bunch of things down off to the side, and then maybe that'll help us figure out what choice is not true. If I look at angle E, it looks like it's on the edge of the circle. And on angles are called inscribed angles. Start spelling that wrong. Inscribed. And I notice that angle E intersects arc CF, just like angle D intersects arc CF. So based on this, I would know that angle E is congruent to angle G, or I'm sorry, D. Angle E is congruent to angle D. And again, that's because inscribed angles are congruent. when they intersect the same arc. Now the same could be said of angle C and angle F. These two angles, if you follow them all the way out, they both intersect arc E, D. So I can say angle C is congruent to angle F for the same reason as E is congruent to D. Inscribed angles that intersect the same arc are congruent. So now based on the markings that I have, I have two sets of angles congruent, which would tell me that my two triangles are similar by angle-angle similarity. Also looking at this picture, I know that I can set up a proportion between the corresponding sides. Since my angles are congruent, my triangles are similar, so then the sides are in proportion. So I would have three sets of corresponding sides in proportion because there's three sides to a triangle. So I can think about CE corresponds to FD and EG corresponds to DG and FG corresponds to CG. So again, corresponding sides are in proportion if the triangles are similar. So now I'm going to go through the options and see which one is not true. The first option says CG, segment CG, is congruent to segment FG. Now if our triangles are similar, segments are not necessarily congruent. They're in proportion though. So I feel like this might be our true statement, or our false statement, not true. But I want to read through the other options to see if this is the one that we actually want to choose. Number two says angle CEG is congruent to angle FDG. We're really talking about angle E and angle D here. And we already said before that angle D is congruent to angle E. So this is a true statement, which means that it's not our choice. Number three says that CE over EG, so that's this side over this side, is equal to FD over DG. So it looks like they were consistent in setting up the proportion. Left side over right side matches the corresponding sides, right side over left side. So this is a true statement, which means it's not our choice. And the next choice, number four, says triangle CEG is similar to triangle FDG. 
and we knew that that was a true statement based off of the fact that we had two pairs of congruent angles. So this is true, which means it's not our choice. So we end up choosing choice one here. Number nine says, which equation represents a line that is perpendicular to the line represented by 2x minus y equals 7? So first I know that perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal slopes. Which just tells us to flip and negate the slope. So for example, if I had, um, say, 3 over 1, if I flip and negate it, it now becomes negative 1 over 3. Flip the fraction upside down and put a negative in front. If we had something like negative 4 over 2, 25, I don't know, uh, and we need the opposite reciprocal, it now becomes, well, negative negative turns positive, so 25 over 4. Flip and negate. So when we look at this equation, I know that it's not ny equals. So my first step is to get ny equals. So I'm going to start by bringing the y to the other side so it becomes positive. So now I have 2x equals y plus 7. Then I'm going to subtract 7 from both sides. So now I have 2x minus 7 is equal to y. My second step is to find the slope. Looking at this equation, I know that the slope is always in front of the x term. So if I take a slope of 2 and I want its opposite reciprocal, 2 is actually 2 over 1. 2, again, is actually 2 over 1. So when I flip and negate, I put the 1 on the top, the 2 on the bottom, and a positive is now negated to become a negative. So I need to find a choice that has a negative 1 half as its slope. And I see that that's represented in choice one. So again, our answers for this page, we have eight is choice one and nine is also choice one. Question 10 says, which regular polygon has a minimum rotation of 45 degrees to carry the polygon onto itself? Regular polygon means that there are congruent sides and angles. And we are rotating to carry the polygon onto itself, meaning we want it to look the same once we rotate it. So before I can even choose an answer here, I have to know what each shape looks like or at least how many sides it has. An octagon, think about an octopus, has eight sides, just like an octopus has eight legs. A decagon has ten sides, just like a decade has ten years. A hexagon has six sides, and a pentagon has five sides. Now it tells me that the minimum rotation needs to be 45 degrees, so I should definitely have something that's equal to 45. Now I know that if I were to rotate something all the way around, I would have a total of 360 degrees. And I'm trying to figure out which shape would have a minimum rotation of 45 degrees, so I'm just going to put an X here because I'm trying to figure out which number of sides I need in order to get 45 here. So again, X represents number of sides. And just like in previous examples, if we have a proportion or a fraction equal to a number, we want to set up the other one, the, the plain old number, as something over 1 so that we can cross multiply. So now we have 45X equals 360. Divide both sides by 45, and now x is equal to 8. And because we did a little bit of prep work, we know that an octagon has 8 sides, so 10 is choice 1. Number 11 says in the diagram of triangle ADC below, EB is parallel, that's what that symbol means, EB is parallel to DC. AE is 9, ED is 5, and AB is 9.2. Our goal here is to figure out the length of AC to the nearest tenth. So I'm going to put a big curly bracket on AC and mark it with an X. Because I have to have the whole right side 
as my final answer, I'm going to see if I can calculate the whole left side. 9 plus 5 gives me a total of 14. So now I want to set up a proportion because when these lines here are parallel, the triangles are similar. The small triangle is similar to the big triangle. So if we were to separate the triangles, it might be helpful. We have a 9 and a 9.2. And then if we focus on the big triangle, we have an x and a 14. And again, just like a previous example, if we set up a proportion of corresponding sides, we know that we can solve for the missing piece. So I'm going to take 9 and put it over 14. If we had not separated the triangles, this would be like taking the top and putting it over the whole. So again, top over whole. So then on the right side, I take 9.2 and put it over x. We're going to cross multiply to solve, so now I have 9x equals 14 times 9.2 gives me a value of 128.8. Our next step is to divide by 9. So now x equals 14.3111 and it keeps going on and on and on. But we're asked to round to the nearest tenth, so the 3 is my tenths place. Look to the right, 5 and above, give it a shove, 4 below, let it go. This 1 is telling me to let it go, so now I end up with x equals 14.3. Choice 3. So again, the answers for this page, number 10 is 1, and number 11 is 3.